Now, here's the consequence breeding. If you select for one trait, that's the only thing you're doing. Everything else that you're not selecting for, too bad. So in the German Shepherd's case, you are selecting for a massive amount of guard tendencies and what we would ascribe as intelligence, usually probably human, like, human reading ability, which is a very, very unique and rare trait. Don't ever, look at, don't ever look at a dog that can read a point same way. That's not an animal behavior that's possible in the wild. So if we look at a little histogram over here for the traits we want in shepherds, we only select the extremes over here. Doesn't matter that you're mating a couple sick cousins together, maybe even siblings from a same set. You need the top ones if you want to move this histogram over. And the consequences of that, we talked about inbreeding with Men as it relates to Mendelian, but all the other complicated additive traits that you are also leaving behind will be a consequence of that. So that's why in a lot of cases, you will see a lot of issues in very recently bred dogs as well. And sometimes these issues are not just, oh, they have this gene, it's a myriad of things. Equally, yeah, <laughs> starting off today really fun. Mink and fox are only bred for the fur. And again, like I talked about, considered crops by the law. There's nothing about them that anybody cares about as far as their other traits. Their fur like can fall off sometimes. They're just like really sloped. Their backs are just like completely messed up the whole time because they live in these cages. You select for one thing, you leave a lot of other stuff behind. That's the consequence of breeding. Now plants, well, you know, it's not gonna feel the same issues, right? Now, you might've been thinking as we're talking about these histograms moving, Hey, wait a sec, I thought you said that can't work. So eugenicists, when they saw how plants or animals could be artificially selected, they're like, we can do this. And they're like, we can do this for an IQ test or a multiple choice test. We're going to shift that histogram and that's what intelligence is. Turns out heritability for multiple choice exams is very, very, very low. So even if you have some weird intense selection pressure where you're only allowing people with 31 ACTs, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to add anything in any direction. It's not heritable. Specifically, too, there's a lot of issues with doing this system in mammals as well, right? This is a lot harder than plants. What things are we not considering in this case? And consider the math here. Go and play with an example when you get the chance of a very low H value. And that will be what you can ascribe to big, complicated, learned traits like taking a multiple choice IQ test. Best way we have for this is identical twins that split families. Typically, the ones that end up in richer families score better on tests, and that's, that's about that. It's not heritable. There's some focused genes out there, we think, but that's not, it's not great. So in this case, I kind of invite you to think about examples that, what else can we put on this sort of spectrum for humans, let's say? Let's try and apply this. So think to yourself. You don't need to turn anything in, but at least get to yourself like one or two examples or so. I'm going to do one to start. I'm going to say risk taking tendency. Some people are freaks. They have to have that like adrenaline rush. I think I've mentioned this before. You guys ever seen that movie where the guy climbs the Yosemite mountain free solo? That guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of those on the far right, right there. Extreme risk taking to the point that it like feeds him. On the other side, People that don't want to leave the house, for example. I'm not, not making a COVID joke there either. But many complicated traits still exist in humans, mammals too. Some of these traits are more shiftable than others. The same trait set could likely be susceptibilities to disease, susceptibilities to anxieties, conditions, anything like that. Some of us are more extremely susceptible. Some of us are extremely non-susceptible. This also goes for one of the bigger examples that I do want to bring up, but that is susceptibility to neurodegeneration. It's a complicated multifactorial disease. Some people are more set up for it than others. That's all we know. We don't have too many genes that are power players in something complicated like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. But if we could, this is a question I've asked some of you. 
one of the other big genetic psychology experiments exists that, remember I talked about the number of, let's say dopamine or serotonin receptors a person has, right? They're born with very few. Can they really experience the same level as happiness as somebody who's born with like an extreme amount? It's complicated, right? But the math sort of makes you think. There's a very good bat, or the, uh, sorry, a very good uh, book by a neurobiologist called What It's Like to Be a Bat, right? And you're just like, their echolocation, right? How do they see the world? What does that look like? Same sort of empathy can go across to anybody in this room that you don't know, right? How can somebody else's reality be different than yours? And it probably is. And that's a question of on and off how much for brain receptors. So risk taking, depression, susceptibility, impulsiveness. And we'll see one more later. One of the easiest and most heritable of all, and that's the stress response. Okay. Looking at everything we did do before with the plants, why is measuring heritability difficult? Why is measuring some of these traits a little more complicated, right? You don't, have to, you don't have to shout anything out. But even if you go back up to those notes, what advantages did plants have that we kind of have to work around in this case with mammals? First off, can't clone any mammals, right? Bad deal. Plants were great because you could clone them, have 100 ones, expose them to the environment and say, well, 84% of the plants were like their cloned parent. This trait is about 84% genetic. What data do we have in humans that is the closest mimic of this to a clone. Yep, yeah, good job. <laughs> Brave, I didn't actually expect anybody to say anything, but yeah. As far as calculating H2 in humans, our best bet are those concordance twin values, remember? Remember it's like when identical twins have a trait, it's like if one of the twins has schizophrenia, 79% chance the other one does, right? That's our best way to mathematically look at complicated things like this. It's not perfect because the environment of two mammals is far different, even if they're genetically identical and in the same household is far different, right? Than the environment of two plants right next to each other in a greenhouse. The twins may meet different people, have different experiences, right? All kinds of weird stuff. So a lot of changes can occur in the environment of a mammal before, before you get going on it. Okay, so let me just see if this is a good move to do this. It's okay, I'm just deciding here. Okay, so to finish quantitative genetics off, um, I'm gonna open a D2L box. It'll probably just be for like a point or so. A good way to sort of master your way around some of this content is write me up a question. I will open a little D2L box for you. You can do, I mean, you can probably do a multiple choice question because any ones that I do use on the exam will pop you a bonus point for two total. Now this is a tough genre, right? Multiple choices are tough. You have to be fair, you can't be rude. And you also gotta know like, how much are you actually testing? Are you actually meeting the outcome here, right? That's why it takes me a whole weekend to write the stupid things, right? I can't make the test too hard or too easy, right? Is there a little laugh there for making it too easy? I think somebody, okay. Come on, I want you to meet the outcomes. But so for now, think about this. I'm not gonna put like a huge timetable on it, but this is kind of a really good way to master stuff that's very unique because you'll have to sort of start to enter my mind. How is he gonna write this question? There's nothing wrong with writing a long answer either. If it's really good, I'll probably still pop you the point if I use it for some sort of like, like a guide question or something. But anything that we covered up here is fair game. A lot of this is conceptual though too, right? Like you could list five genes and describe each one and say, which one is an additive gene? And then the other four are like epistasis ones. Maybe they're incomplete dominant ones. They're not behaving, you know, in that bigger fashion, like, like a lot of genes do. A good example of additive effects genes are kind of muscle density genes. So like actin-2, for example, there's three versions of it. There's one that's very inactive. There's one that's kind of medium and there's one that's like just kind of bigger, right? Just one, two, three, just like that. There's a lot of genes like that that can be quantitative. So we'll do that as the, and when the time comes, but I'll give you some time to think about that and kind of peruse through the notes when, um, when you have that time. Maybe we could do like, I don't know, Sunday or something. You could probably cook up something like pretty quick, but it should be okay.
Sweet. So I want to get out of here. I do want to enter a story that is very exciting. And I know you see a fly. Sorry, don't worry. We'll get to dogs in a sec. But to answer the domestication question, you are, like I said, you are armed with a lot of the tools that you need for that right now. But there's one last one, and that's development. It's the journey and the unique timing of genetics during this process. The fly was our best and initial foray into this to see that one cell replicates instructions, becomes millions or trillions of cells in our case. Now, this is blue text because I'm not testing you on development, I'm testing you on the process here. But everything I've taught you about patterns of on and off, quantities up and down. That really matters here. When you mess with this process, things get difficult. The timing is very important. There are certain genes that are, maybe, that are only active in, let's say, trimester two of a pregnancy, and then they never activate again. Everything has to happen in a very orchestrated concert. Are we getting Zoom bombed? Oh my God. Been waiting for this for two years. No. Shoot. So close. All right. Oh well. Okay. Now, when you mutate a gene that is involved in development, like this gene in Drosophila that does the eye development, yeah, you lose the eye. Big issues. A lot of the stuff that you saw with the flies or even maybe just encountered, a lot of those genes are development genes because they're big, they're powerful. And if you ruin them, you ruin a lot about the organism or change a lot, I should say. On the right, you'll see that these results with the same gene in mammals can also work. You'll see that that mouse embryo on the right will, if it has the two eye loss genes, nothing. So the interesting thing about development is that it's very translatable between species. But the difficult thing is that to study it, you would often kill the organism if you tried to mutate it. And mutating genes was one of our only ways to see like, hey, what happens next in the old days. Now, how do they orchestrate this? I told you how much on and off, when? There's one last piece about genes, where? Where do they distribute? What you're looking at is how a zygote will start to form the beginnings of organ systems, right? Certain cells will shift their protein genes to one side or the other and begin developing maybe a heart on that side, maybe a head on the other, right? Type of stuff. Polarity is a scary sound of word, but it just means where are they setting up? Where are they being pushed to? Where are they activating inside the cell? So add this to the collection of when the time comes and I describe a gene, I describe what happens when you mutate it, stuff like that. And I give you five answers. What is the primary way that this gene is regulated? Is it spatial? Is it on and off pure? Is it dosage up and down? That's where red text like this comes in. I'm not going to ask you what asymmetric protein distribution is, right? We've all seen three tests so far, so you kind of know what's coming the way I'm going to ask these questions. Prepare your notes kind of up against each other like this. Now, still really interesting. I do a very small job doing this, and some of you are in development with, uh, with Dr. Charlotte. He'll do a much better job, but I am meant to show you kind of the main crux of this whole thing. So everything is spatially dictated during development. When genes activate, they sort of rush towards one side of the cell. Because remember, you're only dealing with maybe 100 cells at a time right now. So all these decisions are very, they're very fine-tuned, to say the least. Without getting too grim, 
if you take a fly embryo and move one of the cells that's destined to form the brain and the head and you move it to the behind of the fly, guess where the head's gonna pop up? Yeah, cells are not smart things. Poor fly. You'll also notice about the mouse embryo up there. You can't finish the birth of that animal. It's the mammal regulations don't allow for that. Because as you can imagine, being born without eyes and a lot of stuff, not, not very ethical. So we can only study development genes using embryos a lot of the time of mammals. So gene expression is the name for all the stuff that I've been blabbing about on and off, how much. The last piece of this is that as a blastocyst forms, some cells on the physical top of the embryo will start to form one side of the organism based on what genes they are pushing up to their side. And what I mean by that, and this whole spatial regulation, all matters about proteins, okay? The final products of the gene. This is where, this is the first time I've actually told you that proteins kind of matter as far as expression, I'd say. It's typically the other thing getting made. I believe this is a frog embryo right here that we're looking at. And so long as you still have all the genes you need, not just about which ones are on and off, which ones are low and high. But during this stage, during the embryo, it does matter where they are located and where they are shoved in those early stages, because they will direct what direction to develop in. A lot of these genes that dictate these decisions never hear the light of day after this, after this process in you and I. So, same thing. What we're doing with this is a computer model of a bundle of cells that make a fly. And as you can kind of tell from the green being the wings that fate sort of gets decided by where the proteins go. And equally, something along this line too that I should point out, the spatial recognition between cells that are expressing, let's say the green wing proteins development and the blue like body ones, they inhibit one another. And they say, stay on your side over there. Don't come over here, don't develop like one of us. We'll zoom in on one of these receptors in a sec here. So not only are these going to, oops, come on. Not only are these going to direct development, but they will sort of serve as borders to where everything is. So humans do this too. Hooray, we're embryos once. We all started from a zygote and we had to develop into this from this weird little thing. And it's very dehumanizing to see that our embryo looks quite a bit like every other embryo on the planet that is a mammal. Yeah, you can, it's very hard to tell the difference between a human embryo at you know, two or three weeks than it is um, some of the others. The plants are different. There's the plant embryo. They're fun to study because their cell walls make them much easier and more rigid to see like which is developing into what. Oh, fun examples. Okay. So I talked about how do you form that border wall and say, don't develop into this. We're doing that. One of those genes is called notch. It comes on the surface of the cell and it reads the other genes from the cell around it and says like, and talks to them. And when they come into contact, they're like, stop. Stop growing this direction. This has a pretty big role to play in the beginning of triggering some of these spatial recognitions of an area to become something. Notch will start getting expressed in green right here on some cells that are destined to become one of the organs. What that will do is sort of influence the cells around it. And collectively, when you start having these little asymmetric patterns in an area, they will begin to all kind of coalesce into one team. They will all start to, start to read the notch signal and they will all start to connect to one another. And they will start to form that organ system. And this all has to be done outside the cell spatially.
So genes that physically exist outside the cell and sort of brush away other organ systems, not just one of those ones that kind of directs that like border for, for, for forming. So again, kind of another blue text. I just like a lot of these pictures to kind of help you see how everything's forming. But like I said, sometimes these steps are so small that a couple of genes may be involved in them for a week, maybe even a day, and then they're silenced for the rest of the animal's life, and that's it. So we need to study something a little easier than a human. We need to study something that worked at a smaller level that we could count all the cells for. That's a nematode. A full adult nematode only has about like 1,100 cells. We can count all those and see their fates 100%. You can see that on the right, that we have that map, that sort of that fate map from the zygote from the beginning. And nematodes are kind of nasty, but they're, they're actually pretty good little organisms to work with. First thing we saw is that an adult nematode actually during development actually has about 1,300 cells, but only ends up with 1,100. This was the first time we actually stumbled on apoptosis. This is the cell signal that says for a cell to die. Now this can happen if the cell is unhealthy or in this case, you can kind of trim cells away from the final organism. So the classic example here is that human embryos still come out with sort of webbing between toes and hands. But gradually the cells in between die. And that's how you kind of form that area. So this is way number two that you can form an organism. Not only can you grow in space, but then you can kind of edit and take away to make that final form. So it's very different than necrosis. This is something to point out, but it's not on the test. Necrosis is if you like get a massive radiation or a burn or a freeze or something and the cell just blows up in, entirely like a disaster. Apoptosis is a very regulated, like happy process usually. So with all of this, you've heard the term stem cell before, I suppose. Remember that the zygote itself is a stem cell, right? Because it can stem into anything. It will become gradually through replication, everything. So armed with what we know about gene expression and saying like, well, what if we took an adult like differentiated cell? And what I mean by that is that it's at its final stage. It's at its final like activation. What if we tried to take one of these, like let's say immune cells and turn it back into a stem cell, go backwards in time? See, not good though. It's not gonna be a happy ending. To go backwards in time, what you, you would need to do, you'd basically gradually need to reintroduce in reverse order the genes that made it go forward in time the first time. To try and take an adult cell, say a plasma cell, re-engineer it over and over and over into a progenitor. This is something called reversion that we have been trying. It somewhat works to a degree, but again, to turn back time, you need to activate a lot of bad, bad, bad characters. A lot of the genes to turn back time that made that initial growth of an organism, they're oncogenes. They're growth genes, they're cell growth genes. And when you activate them and you can't control them, things typically go bad in the organism. Because in a perfect world, what we could do is if we had control of this process, we could make any pluripotent cell, that's the one at the top, that's the goal, and turn it into any cell we want. Brain support cells, muscle cells for those with dystrophies, Skin cells for those with burns and like shreds and like grafts and stuff, right? Something like a pluripotent cell and the ability to have that represents sort of a holy grail in biology that it's very difficult because the decisions downstream, a lot of the times they leave behind, they leave the door locked behind them. 
Because as you can imagine, you don't actually want this happening spontaneously to go back in time, back to a pluripotent stem cell. Now, it's not impossible to sort of synthetically create some stem cells, okay? If you Google this, you'll be surprised at the number of stem cell clinics in America. Let me tell you, that is one of the most dangerous buildings you could step into and have anything done to you, okay? People will be like, hey, I'm gonna give you stem cells for your skin. A lot of people finally are coming, coming through, suing these places because bone will start growing in their face. because we are very bad at controlling what this turns into. Sure, if you put a pluripotent cell around skin, most of the skin cells will say, hey, we're skin cells, behave like us. Uh, but you wanna take that risk with genetics. Think of this as sort of an invasive species that you would put on your body and say, fix the problem. But instead, maybe the invasive species or the fixing species becomes the bad thing. So yeah, don't ever go into a stem cell clinic. And you'd be, and again, it's kind of an interesting thing with the law and genetics of how much uncertainty exists in this process that allows for something like that to exist. Don't hear about that a lot, do you? Very scary thing. It's a very hard operation to remove. So it's kind of just we talked about. Technically, the study of development was the study eventually of cancer genes. A lot of the stuff we found were growth genes, growth stopping genes cell killing genes. So kind of an interesting little aside. We've seen these before. BCL2 is a survival gene, just says, hey, don't blow up. Turns out that cancer cells to survive, they have a lot of those, or they usually have two copies, maybe you have 20. This is actually a very interesting way to kind of stumble upon oncogenes. Okay, we're almost at our, at our break in our fun example, so don't worry. Last little bit, and we will kind of hammer this home later, but lots of genes, and I've, we've talked a lot about genes that have, they do one trait. We've talked a lot about traits that come from hundreds of genes, right? But development's unique. A single gene may have three very different roles during the embryogenesis and development. Single genes, for example, control melanation in mammals at the same time while controlling bone formation while at the same time controlling stress levels. We'll meet that gene in a sec. But this is the first time that you've seen a gene that's responsible for multiple traits. Single gene, lots of traits. Very different than lots of genes, single trait, right? Development is the key to harnessing these because only at this time when you're that embryo can so much action happen from one gene on the entire organism. Okay, we'll take a break. Well, this is what I was just talking about. Dang it, we're not taking a break. One more slide. Okay, that's what it's called, pleopatry. Dang it, that was supposed to be a, a drop, a surprise. I missed, did the slides. Shoot. Okay, well, there's your term. One gene responsible for multiple traits. And when you kill that gene, you kill those traits. So imagine a recessive gene, but like three things are going down because of it, because of it being gone can make a lot of movement on an organism if you find the most powerful gene in it and kind of go after it. What this little bit down here that says, are some of our complex traits the opposite of polygenic? Yeah, there's plenty of stuff on this histogram of let's call it our little happiness window, right? or susceptibility, whatever, anything. Sometimes a single gene is gonna move that thing massively one way or the other. It's not gonna be slow. You can't calculate that with the math and the heritability. Remember, we had to throw those genes out. So they're a special case. We'll meet a couple here. All right, meet one of my favorite characters in all of biology. Leptin mouse. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, um, but take a break and um, take a look at it in, it in all its glory. If you want more pictures, Google leptid mouse.
everybody's first time seeing the Lepton mouse is always joyous, but <laughs> it, uh, obviously we'll have some caveats here, but it's okay. All right, so let's figure out when you knock out the leptin gene, how do you get this little plumpus right here? Oh, obese animals are kind of my weakness. They're really fun, but that's not healthy. All right, so leptin is a hormone style gene. It orchestrates several processes. Trait number one, it regulates appetite. Trait number two, it regulates will to exercise. And now downstream, we can see. Okay, so the first time that we knock this gene out in mice, and so we'll call it like, you know, an X slash X, for example, for double knockout, and this is just wild type, wild type. We are like, oh my God, we've done it. We can, we, can, we can make a drug out of this and make money, right? Humans, sadly, a little different. Homo sapien biology has a lot of resistance mechanisms to leptin loss or leptin renewal, that's said. But in any case, leptin is responsible for a lot of your energy balance and your energy storage type stuff, right? And I'm not saying this doesn't contribute at all. Like I said, each little piece matters. Without leptin, some of this energy storage stuff is a little, a little more... A little, little more active, let's say, because leptin usually is trying to burn stuff for you. And it's opposite. You don't need to know this for any tests. Just an example is ghrelin. So without leptin, ghrelin takes over and ghrelin gets the mice not exercising and storing all their energy. So like we talked about with the children that starved, right? It's, like, it's very likely that leptin lost was silenced, for example. That law, that leptin was probably silenced forever because it's like, uh-uh, we're never losing any energy again. You starved and you died almost. Similarly, this has plenty of effects in the brain where you will get reward signals without leptin when you are sedentary. And it will be like, yes, happy. Don't move. Don't waste that energy. Leptin is responsible for a lot of hibernation species, right? You want to gradually, that level has to rise so that bears go to sleep over the winter, right? So anytime something affects metabolism, sorry, mitochondria, here we go again, or the brain, you will likely have multiple traits if you can count behaviors as traits, which I think most animal biologists do. Now, when leptin is present, it is responsible for regulating quite a bit of things. So this is blue text because the test is not on leptin nor leptin mice, sadly. It is on the difference between a gene like this versus a gene that is just a dominant recessive for one trait, right? Versus a gene that is one of the contributing genes towards collagen that makes you a little taller. Very different roles. And if you mess with one of the powerful ones like leptin, you see what we can, you see the result we can have. One more time. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Now it's, set. see, it's bad though, because in like, and like I said, this didn't work in humans because Homo sapiens have a lot more, if you lose leptin or it's lower, we have a lot more redundant mechanisms that can take over for that. We are built not, we are built sort of to store energy because our ancestors did not have a lot of energy gradually. So the ones that survived, they were the ones that could store it quite well. A lab mouse in that environment, not going to be the same as a human either. 
And sometimes the leptin mouse get bigger experiments. They just kind of make them, they just give them food all the time. And it's kind of sad. So I don't know if they do super great. So as far as any of the traits we've thought about, what are, think of any other thing we've thought about that could be pleiotropic. Any other gene, any other set of traits that come down to one thing. And there is one, and I've used this gene or genetic material before. And it's a development gene too. So you're not shouted out again. But half of us in this room have a very large set of anatomical differences than the other half in this room, right? Here we go again. Okay, and specifically that SRY sort of initiation gene, when that is present, that will initiate in development at the embryo, the male program, go, 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 go. It's a lot of traits. I think it was only a couple, like a week ago that I was like, no, 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 we're not that, we're not that different. One X is silenced. And now I'm like, no, 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 we're totally different. See, it's complicated, but you can still like parse out the pieces for each one. So SRY is kind of is a big development gene like we just saw. It dictates the spatial and timing regulation of that program that is not initiated with no Y, at least with no SRY. If you want to get complicated, we can talk in office hours. Okay, it's not really break time, but no differences for Scout. That wolf is like kind of aggressively taxidermied down there. <laughs> it's kind of scary. <laughs> Oh, woven. Okay. So now you're armed to ask the question. We will diagnose this. And I am a big gen domestication genetics person. This is fun. Let's just start with the easy one. What do you want to have as a pet? Be creative. Be funny. I, I like, yeah. And, and we'll, we'll diagnose like why certain animals, they're better set for this. The bottom text that you can't read is what features are necessary that you think, but... Go ahead for now and just upvote down. Well, you don't have to downvote if you don't want, but <laughs> lots of stuff. And we'll, I'll get to actually, I'll kind of go up to them. So, and obviously if you don't want to do the poll everywhere, just get a little scrappy of paper and you can turn it into me. That's okay. I'm not going to count this for strict points, but I do want to see who's around. Where'd he go? I don't know, where'd he go? Is this the one? Oh, it totally is. Yeah. There we go. Yay. Oh, who said penguin? Good job. I want a penguin so bad. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yay. I'm trying to see some of the others. Trash pandas, <laughs> killer whale, moose, dinosaurs. Don't downvote dinosaurs. That'd be sweet. Everybody saw Jurassic Park. That was awesome. Trash panda. I'm surprised nobody said just dog yet. Because most, most of the time I do this, somebody's like, dog, cat. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's fair. I like dogs too. Kind of let democracy have its way here. And I, yeah, I kind of influenced the vote by being like, I love penguins, but oh well. Sometimes, God, pandas are so goofy. I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad they're doing a lot better. Oh no, don't downvote penguins, how dare you? <laughs> All right, so we have a lot of fun stuff. Red pandas I love, dolphins fun, elephants, a lot of stuff. Let's see if anybody's getting down, <laughs> downvoted down here. Manatee go for sea slug, that's funny. <laughs> it's like the Santa Cruz banana slugs. That's okay, that's fun. All right, killer whales, man. I don't know why people like killer whales. They're terrifying, man. They'll rip you to pieces. The reason killer whales don't kill scuba divers is because they're so smart and cautious. They don't know if humans are poisonous. They're not friendly. They're just not that hungry. Okay, just to clarify that. 
Don't ever swim with a killer whale, please. Anything that kills a shark is not gonna get near me. All right, fun times. I'll leave this up for a little bit going by. All right. Here comes the list for what is possible and what is not. And there's some fun, interesting stuff. So, got to cross two off for one of my favorite and most interesting re re um, reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, rhinoceroses are just too angry and ornery. Zebras represent a weird thing, right? They're a horse subspecies, right? We domesticated horses later, right? Problem is, Homo sapiens evolved in Africa. Everywhere Homo sapiens went, once they went from Africa, all the mammals died, except Africa, because everything that evolved there evolved alongside and to hate us. They survived us. It's why everything in Africa is so dangerous is because they are the, they are the final survivors of generations of selection against a bipedal primate like us that is really nasty. And to this day, when African species see a human, they don't like it. And that instinct is ingrained to see that stick figure bipedal primate like us. No, nah, not going to happen. Same with African wild dogs. All right. Close. Eats a lot of meat, though, and doesn't like not super great. And they also kind of see us as food. So that's not great. Cheetahs would be a really fun one. Problem is one thing you need for domestication. You need to make more babies. And cheetah's mating ritual is extremely intricate and long distance, like sprint running to show fitness. You can't replicate it very easily. It's why it's so hard in zoos, too. Dingoes, well, they re -feralized. They were actually dogs once. They're not coming back. Let's just say that. Now they don't like humans again. Aquatic and very ornery. Wow. That would not be a good idea. <laughs> Some species also have sort of a roaming tendency. And when you put them in captivity, they'll just die. Or they won't, they won't breed. And you need to have babies to have domestic species. Equally, you need to have something that has a fast maturity. In maybe one year, you can start having babies for this thing, right? Bears take a long time. They're hibernating half the time. Equal thing with meat-eating things, predators. That's a lot of food you got to be making to feed that thing, right? You got to domesticate stuff to feed to your domesticated pet, right? It's a lot of resources. <laughs> too mischievous raccoons, very bad. They're too smart. House training issues is what I have written for them. <laughs> so, and a lot of us, a lot of you put polar bear. Yeah, those, they see us as food. It's not gonna happen, sorry guys. <laughs> they also need to have some, some framework for, some framework for social, tendencies, something, some sort of herd or some sort of maternal paternal instinct that we can seize on and make work. They also can't have a huge panic tendency. That's why deer are not really good at domesticating. They're such a prey species. They don't have any, any window for not being stressed. Now, there's a big difference between domestication and tameness. These two were famous when I was kind of younger. They were magicians. And they had these two tigers. What is this, Sigrid and something, these two guys? Either Siegfried and Roy, that's right. Either way, one time they did a light show and the tiger got pissed and it mauled one of them. It was never domesticated. But from a baby, you can take a small animal and kind of condition it psychologically to either fear or not hurt humans. But typically that tameness process and the stuff you see with the crazy Joe guy with the tigers, it's not a fun upbringing for the tiger. It's a lot of hitting and a lot of like, hardcore psych training. Domestication is that something's born and it's not stressed by humans. And in the case of dogs, it actually runs towards that bipedal primate and says, this is happy for me, this is serotonin. So it's a big distinction between genetics. I'm not gonna, wait, am I gonna spell psych right? Dang it, wait, I did, maybe. Let's just move on. We're gonna cut that recording. <laughs> Okay, how did we do this? Does this come down to quantitative stuff? We'll see one of the examples, but we'll see that there was a shortcut built in and why this actually worked. There's features about dogs that are distinct from wolves. And those are highlighted here. 
Obviously, scouts' disposition is happy. Wolves, not. They have to survive. They have to be mean, right? There's a couple other things with domesticated species that show up, at least in dogs here, and you'll see it somewhat in the other species. All the stuff that was hard cartilage before sort of starts flopping. Your ears are floppy all of a sudden. Your tail's kind of floppy. It was weird. We didn't select for that. We selected for tameness. Similarities, technically the physiology, pack instincts, apex predators, good dog. Let's look at pleopatry quick here. So first intention here, what you are selecting for with domestication is tameness or in our, in the biochemical sense, low stress response, low levels of something we call glutocorticoids. It's in blue because it's an example, but it is the example. This axis works by the brain will see something that will translate this to hormones in the pituitary that will translate to the adrenal gland. This will make a bunch of cortisol and glucocorticoids. These are your chronic stress hormones. These are the ones that make you alert and nervous and that that feeling doesn't calm for hours, right? This is the thing that you feel in the anticipation before a game or a performance of some kind. Now this level can vary. This is very much something that can go up, down, be variable. So let's take a look at the squirrels on campus, right? So if you're looking at a population of all the squirrels in Minnesota, You, at, on campus, you are looking at these ones that have super low fear, right? They'll just run in, like run up in front of you and steal a ramen brick in front of you, right? They don't fear humans. That stress level is really low for them. Those cortisol levels are massively low. Those genes are barely active for them. Inherently, in evolution, this gives them an advantage. Hawks don't come around where humans are, right? There's a lot of trash on campus too. They made a trade off here. Now too little fear, does get you picked up by one of the falcons around here. But too much fear, you're never going to go out and eat, right? Those extremes will die too. So the fact that campus sort of has a niche for this really low fear provides us all we need to say that somewhere in the population there's an extreme for some of these animals of very, very low amounts of stress. So take a little break here and consider for yourself. Is somebody predisposed to a certain level of this pathway that we've talked about here today? Go ahead and take the break now.
how many people would find them on the side of a predisposed genetic happy window exists on some spectrum for all of us, let's say. I'm not raising my hand to endorse it, I'm just saying you can if you want. Alternatively, we control our own fates, just be happy. I'm kidding, I'm not, it's not that simple. <laughs> Dang, nobody wants to take a slide on this. You're not. So, the number of genes that are active, the types of genes you don't have mutations in, the stickier some of these neurotransmitters are, right? That trends things one way or another. We most definitely have, we can most definitely still exist on this sort of spectrum, right? And there are additive elements to that. But those glucocorticoids, if those are low, suddenly we're a lot more tame. So sometimes it doesn't take additive effects in math, it just takes change that one gene and turn it down all the way. So when you're selecting for something very quickly, you may eventually key on the one thing that matters. It doesn't always have to be additive. So, fun story time. I know, shoot, I shouldn't give you a break and then do the story, but it's okay. How's Fox? So, this is a Russian scientist called Belyev. Remember the Lyshenko guy that was like, we're going to freeze wheat and genetics don't matter, right? Yeah, so he was kind of Stalin's boy, and so he'd kind of kill a lot of people that said genetics mattered, including Belyev's brother, who was a scientist, et cetera. So, because remember, with the ideals that everybody's on the same page, you can't say that everybody has different genes, right? Took it to the wrong extreme. What he wanted to do was an experiment in secret. So while he was still working for the Soviet government, and he had said, okay, I'm not going to be a geneticist anymore, he bought a fox fur farm. And he said, I'm going to try a thousand year experiment to domesticate the fox. We did it in dogs in 70,000 years. I bet I could do it in a thousand. Cool. So he takes the foxes from the fur farms, which remember, these are technically caged phenotypes, so they know what a human looks like, even though they are, they're not in the best shape. All he did was breed low stress foxes together. The measurement that he kept for this on the data was you open the cage, and how far can your hand go in with the glove before the fox bites you? That was the metric. Now equally, to prove his point, this is the side that's tough. He bred the ones that were very angry together. Don't laugh, <laughs> it's gonna be bad. To prove his point. Now, these foxes exist today. This wasn't a thousand year experiment. If you go to the farm today, because the experiment is ongoing, often publishes in Nature Genetics, you can see the high stress foxes and sort of the hell that they're in. It's very distinct to see what it can do. If that glucocorticoid pathway, that stress pathway, if it is on all the time, just burning, right? It's very disturbing to see. But equally, about 30 generations of low stress foxes and what he would do, he had a very harsh selection criteria. He called those elites, foxes that eventually, instead of the fear from the glove, they would start to come up. They would breed them together. 30 generations later, he domesticated the fox. How did that happen so quickly? Turns out heritability with stress and that path receptor we saw, it's pretty high. It's a pretty big deal. Now, as you can imagine, so it's going to be over here at like 0.8. So about 80% of your stress levels, let's say, in this example, are due to genetic influences, purely. No environment, no, no stress events needed. So I should clarify, it's a high heritability. It's not 80%. This is just an example. this meant is that generation after generation, as far as tameness goes, each one would be shifting and shifting. Now, for the sake of posterity here, imagine that we at now at this position, let's say that we've done this a bunch of times so far, right? 
eventually there was one generation that came out from a fox named Ludmika, I think. And instead of a small shift in their tameness, it was just boom, they're totally different. Massive change, no longer wild, no longer any fear of humans born to find a bipedal primate. DNA cannot change that fast. Mutations don't have the time. And the other thing that was unique is that on the left were those first 30 generations where foxes are black or gray or silver. See that sloped tail, their pointed ears, their joints are quite stiff. When that big shift that I just told you about, when one came out and it was done, it was domesticated, they changed, they were white, their pigments were weird. In fact, their pigments were like brown, orange, white, mixed. Everything was crazy. All these traits came along with the tameness. And nobody knew why. So we call this domestication syndrome. Not 100% sure. Let's see if this works. I don't know if it's going to, oh no. I don't know if it's going to work here, the link, because, and then. Oh, wait, I remember this. Sorry, there's like a stupid way that I have to. There we go. Fox nose. Here's the aggressive line. He's not even reaching in the thing at this point. It's already pissed. Something bred to fear humans. And as you can hear in its voice, insanely upset. This is only after 30 generations, right? Good. He's reaching in. I think he gets after him once. I don't know. But it's just in the corner. Not having a time. You have to think to yourself, was this right to do, even though it proves the point? Why it's so hard to study behavioral genetics? God damn it. He was so Don't care, alive. HBO. Come on. Well, very different, right? I don't know why I won't be so soon, sorry. All right. Just want to play. Quite a different reaction. Right? The minute bipedal primate shows up, happy, digging for food, wanting to play. Tail's wagging, too. You ever seen a wolf tail wag even with other wolves? Uh -uh. See how, like, fluffy and floppy it is, too, right? See how rigid the last one was, right? Yay! Happy. You know, so. It happened in 30 generations. That's a complicated trait. We thought it was going to take a thousand years. Get out of here, John Travolta. All right. How did that all happen? Why did that shift occur? And equally, why did the physical change happen? That final massive shift in the domesticated foxes basically indicated that that cortisol, that fear pathway was shut down. It was just gone at least for humans in this case. So once you lose the gene expression of this entire pathway, some of these genes are probably off at this point, or they're just completely low. You didn't mutate any of these genes. This is all a matter of epigenetics. Signals that said, turn this off, or signal that says, turn this low. So a way to visualize this is imagine 
one of those adrenal genes. On the left is a wild animal, a wild fox. It's loaded with stress receptors. The minute something shows up from the brain, any stimuli, it's gonna get kind of activated. On the right, it's probably what a stress cell looks like in a domesticated fox. Very limited, very small. The one on the left is the one you probably saw first, right? Freaking out, stress like flying in at all these points, hitting all these receptors. Versus the last one, it's like, well, yeah, whatever. So, question on the board though, remained. Why the physical hitchhiker traits to this massive, complicated domestication phenotype? Why the coat changes? Why the cartilage changes? Why the bone structure changes? Remember I introduced you to a gene before that was just an example. Glucocorticoid. Yeah, it has a lot to do as an adult for stress, but it's a gene that orchestrates bone development and hair pigmentation as well. So when it's lowered in that first domestication of foxes, it really came out, their development was impacted. Their pigmentation process did not finish. Gene was too low. Their bone development did not finish. Their genes were too low. That doesn't mean they're unhealthy. It just means that the pathways that were meant to finish did not, and you have a different physical organism all of a sudden. This is how you can affect something like this. Domestication syndrome is something we see across most of our domesticated species, but dogs will always be the one that we have pushed furthest to their physical and mental capabilities. They are the ones that are best to study on this spectrum of what it's possible to do with a single set of genes. What extremes can you reach? Not always in a good way everything in here will start to develop differently once you affect this. And it says reduced brain size literally doesn't mean they're dumb. It just comes out smaller. It's a package deal though, because one gene, the one gene that controls stress the most that we were selecting for and we have selected for in these animals happens to also control melanation and bone structure. And that's why you can see happy wagging tails, floppy little ears, puppy features, right? That's why on the upper left, you don't see that in a wild animal. A development, that selection strain never happens to them. This is why you can get so many pigment colors with foxes now that are domesticated. And you do all kinds of fun stuff. You see this in cows, pigs, ferrets, dogs, obviously. Think about all the domesticated animals we have, all the color varieties, right? Big deal with that is that in the wild, there's a pretty good color to just stay. That's your camouflage color, don't ruin it. Once humans are protecting you, that selection kind of relaxes. You don't need to care as much. So I want to ask everybody's thoughts on this. It's a very cool experiment. It's one of my favorites on the planet. And don't just give me a no, that's boring. Or yes, that's also boring. Was it worth finding all this? Was it worth knowing more about ourselves because of this experiment? Knowing more about all the species that we're partners with? And do trust me, Homo sapiens would not be that keystone, that, uh, I don't know what to say, but like that big species, if it weren't for dogs, if it weren't for some of these other animals. And no, no polar bears this time.
So the interesting, I mean, the thing is with Belyev is that he pulled off one of the biggest, probably one of the biggest genetics experiments of all time in secret. Couldn't let Lyshenko or his henchmen find him, they kill him. Eventually when Stalin was gone and Lyshenko was thus gone, there was more freedom in this. And today the farm still runs and is still a valuable experiment. And now to actually keep it afloat, they do have to sell the foxes as pets. But one of the saddest parts of this story is that uh, Ludmilla, the, one of the original elite mom foxes, that is probably the, one of the keystones that came out as one of the most tame foxes they'd ever seen, and she bred most of the low-stress line. Um, her and her pups, like I said, there comes with a big price with trusting humans, and it kind of puts the weight on your shoulders as humans to, like, you know, remember what you're responsible for. Uh, the farm wasn't, you know, funded to have security. People knew it was a fur farm. That's all they knew. So a bunch of people came in, bust in the house, saw a fox walking around, and skinned her because she ran right up to humans. She trusted humans. So did her pups, except one. One did survive. And that one became the elite for the rest of that generation. But the fact that you lost that initial one is really always like devastating. And it's a, it's a super sad story. I have that, I have the main book about this, How to Tame a Fox and How to Build a Dog is the title. If you ever got, if, you, if anybody ever wants to borrow that, because it's a really cool story of how they had to put this all together. Okay. So I'll get to read them. And yeah, don't worry if you're getting some downvotes, you, you gotta put your ideas out there and defend them. It's okay. It's a hard thing to talk about. And like for me as an animal person, you know, and don't be afraid if you don't have any upvotes, people just won't scroll that far. <laughs> it's a hard thing for me to talk about as an animal person because I learned so much from it. And it is this amazing thing that got me into, you know, genetics and biology and all this a lot. I would say this part that my, when my genetics prof went through this, he went a little deeper since that was a technically a behavioral genetics class. We don't have so much time. But it was, it was something tough to read about. But there's very much a reward for domestication, right? Those uh, wild versions of the sheep, Mouflon, there's only like a thousand left. There's billions of sheep. Cows, their ancestral ancestor, the Auric, all dead. I think like 1700 something. They're all gone. There's no such thing anymore. Billions of cows. Wolves, I don't know. I can't remember if it's less than a million now. Meanwhile, there's about 7 billion dogs or so. So it pays evolution wise to be domesticated but not in the way as far as welfare goes every time. Cool. So we'll keep this open for a bit, but you can kind of take a look. So looking at this, two versions of Pleiopatry exist. The one on the right is the true master regulator that we talked about today, Puga corticoid, just controls two things directly, has two direct effects. Sometimes genes are responsible for multiple things, but kind of remember this in the uh, epistasis and the pathways that we'd see. That's kind of what's on the left here. What's on the right is much more the type of question I would ask as to not complicate what I'm after. A gene that directly influences multiple things. Typically, but not always, this will be involved with development like you saw. It'll have a role as an adult, but it'll also have major roles in development that will trigger different, different traits with an adult. Okay. I'll leave you with one last thing. We'll get to finish this story next week. It's not so much that, we'll finish this a little bit. It's not so much that domesticated animals are quite that different either. This is another final stage of this thing. Those low stress levels do need to be keyed on 
But the strange thing is, is that wolf puppies are quite amenable. They're really nice. Typically domestication is just, how do you keep something in the puppy stage forever? Talk about that next week. Okay, good job.